our Lord is asked a question regarding fasting. And note that he doesn't say that you don't need to fast. He's just saying, well, this is not the right time for fasting. And the analogy that he gives, or he uses this analogy of the unshrunken cloth or a piece of unshrunken cloth that is used to patch up an old cloak, as well as new wine being put into old wineskins. And basically what he's saying is you need to have a new way of looking at things. So if the problem with putting an unshrunken cloth on an old cloak to use it as a patch, when you wash it, the unshrunken cloth will shrink and it will make a worse tear. So it's not ideal. The other thing with wineskins, wineskins, when they're um, newly made, they're capable of expanding, of stretching, and wine that is new continues to ferment, so it produces bubbles, so it causes the wineskin to expand. If it's an old wineskin, it's dry, it's no longer capable of, of stretching, so new wine in old wineskins will burst the wineskins and the wine is, is lost and the wineskins are destroyed. So basically what he's saying is, you have to have a new way of looking at things. You need a new uh, wineskin, in other words, a new approach, a new understanding. And what is this new approach, this new understanding that he's talking about? Well, basically, you know, when the Jewish people, when they thought of God, they thought of God as being distant from them, even though occasionally God would interact with them. But the, the new way in which they are to think of God is God in their midst. God who loves them so much that he wants us to call him Father or even Abba, Daddy. And also that God is incarnate in their midst. And this is hard for them to, to accept and, and to even to, to conceive of. And it's worthwhile for us to, to reflect on this. So when it comes to fasting, you know, there's many benefits to fasting. And interestingly enough, all the major religions of the world practice fasting, some form of fasting. So in other words, every major religion in the world recognizes the benefit of fasting. And I, I don't want to talk too much about the benefits of fasting today, maybe just slightly, but I wanted to focus on the purpose of fasting or the intention behind fasting. In other words, why do people fast? So somebody might fast in order to lose weight. It's good, good reason. Some people might fast in order to be healthier. So in other words, by fasting, your organs have a chance to cleanse themselves out. So you, you're healthier in general. You may not necessarily want to lose weight, but you fast in order to be healthier. And of course, there's religious reasons for fasting. And the religious reasons, um, they, they basically boil down to, uh, to a couple of them. And so when we fast, we're giving up something that we naturally desire, food. And our desire for food is a very strong desire. It's a very strong passion that we have for food because if we don't eat, we're not going to survive. God wants us to survive, to continue to live. And so he's put in within, within us this desire for food, a desire to eat, to be able to sustain ourselves. But because we make a sacrifice of this most natural of desires, God doesn't allow himself to be outdone in charity. So we're making a huge sacrifice. So God will compensate us by giving us an abundance of his graces. The other thing is that when we fast, we are practicing self-mastery, self-control, self-discipline, which we all need. And you see, what tends to happen in the spiritual life is that we lack self-control, we lack self-mastery, and our passions often dominate. So when we think of, the, of, the, of a human person, you know, at the top we can say we have the intellect, the human intellect, our reasoning capabilities. Then we have the human will, determining, you know, what we choose to do, what we will to do. And then we have the passions. And the passions are the lowest. There are bodily desires, but also the things that enable us to perform in a certain way. You know, let's say somebody was a really good preacher and they could yell and, you know, cause all kinds of um, emotional response from the crowd, right? They're employing their passions according to their reason. So reason dominates.
But you see, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, part of their punishment was that they would lose what's called original justice, which refers to the harmony between the intellect, the will, and the passions. So the intellect was obedient to God, the will was obedient to the intellect, and the passions obeyed the will. So part of the punishment is that we would experience some disobedience within ourselves. So the will and the passions are no longer totally obedient to the intellect. So the will, which is in the middle, is kind of drawn or, or divided between following the intellect, which is above, or following the passions, which is below. And when we give in to the passions, the passions they take on a supremacy, they, they tend to dominate, and so the will becomes used to giving in to the passions. And the more that an individual does this, the intellectual abilities diminish. In other words, the intellect becomes clouded. They can't see spiritual things, so they just desire their, their passions. They, they think that their passions will satisfy them. So we need to mortify the passions, and one of the ways we do this is by being diligent, doing things at the right time in the right, right way, but also by self-denial, especially fasting. So we make a sacrifice. God rewards us for that. We practice self-discipline. And this is very important because when it comes time to temptation, it's the passions usually that draws to temptation. You know, it's true there are some sins that are intellectual in nature, such as pride, but often, you know, it's, it's a desire for food or, or sexual pleasure or, or things like that, or even laziness. It's really the passions of the body wanting to be pampered. So if we have self-mastery, we're able to say, no, I'm not going to give in to those foolish temptations. I'm going to follow the intellect. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to focus on God. I'm not going to entertain these, these, these temptations. So we gain self-mastery. We gain self-control. And the other thing is that when we fast, it actually enables us to be more focused. So um, when we have more food in our stomach, there's more blood going to our stomach, it makes it harder for us to think clearly, and we're easily distracted because we can't focus. But when we fast, there's actually more blood going to the brain so that we can focus on what we want to focus on. And because we're doing this for spiritual reasons, for the sake of God, God enables us to focus on Him more fully. So our prayer life is, is enhanced when we fast. So as I mentioned, there's different motives for fasting, for health reasons, to lose weight, but also to grow spiritually, to grow closer to God. So these, these things that I mentioned. And notice our Lord says, you know, um, they cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. In other words, our Lord is giving them the intention of fasting or the purpose of fasting to be with the bridegroom, to be with God, to be with the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate. So the disciples were already with him. They were already focused on him. And in one sense, we could say they were practicing self-denial because they left their homes. They had to sleep outside sometimes. So they're, they're practicing all kinds of self-denial. But their focus was Jesus Christ. They watched him. They listened to him. In many ways, they imitated him. They learned from him. They admired him. They reflected on him, on his words, on his actions. Now, here's the very, uh, very important thing that we ought to take away from this. Not just the importance of fasting, but the importance of being with Jesus. And this is where in, in, in Christian spirituality, in Catholic spirituality, the, the very great emphasis that is placed on meditative prayer. In other words, to meditate on the life of Christ. In other words, to do all those same things that the apostles did when they were with our Lord. To observe him, to listen to him, to imitate him, to admire him, to gaze upon him. So we can't do that in real life because our Lord is not here. But in Christian meditation, it's almost like we imagine ourselves being there. Or we imagine our Lord being here and the events that we read about in scriptures being enacted in our presence in the here and now. So when we meditate on these things, we're basically 
um, like the apostles who were with our Lord. And so, so the point, the whole point of this, the, the, the final point that I want to make is that, yes, fasting is good, but meditation is even better. And because, as, as our Lord clearly points out, the wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So yes, it's good to fast. And in fact, when we join fasting with meditation, it's even better. But if we can imagine the bridegroom being with us or imagine ourselves being with him, as we reflect on various passages of scripture, then we're kind of in a position where we don't even need to fast because we're being like the apostles who have left behind the things of this world to take some time out in our daily schedule to be with our Lord, to meditate on his life, and to strive to imitate him, to learn from his example. Just a brief announcement. On Tuesday, we will have a funeral at 10.30 a.m. for Davis Dominic Suen. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.